Okay, so imagine spending half of your childhood in jail. Sounds crazy, right? Well, for one 11-year-old boy named Jordan, that was a reality. This kid was arrested and charged for slaying his dad's new fiance, who had recently moved in with her two kids from a previous relationship. And she had already been eight months pregnant with Jordan's first younger half-sibling. The little boy apparently took out his soon-to-be stepmom with his own Yeah, he had his own weapon at 11. Oh, and did I mention that he was tried in court as an adult? Buckle up guys, this is a super twisted story. Jordan Brown grew up in the town of Wampum, Pennsylvania. And don't worry if you haven't heard of Wampum because at a population of 600 people, I'm guessing not many other people knew about it as well. Well, until this story. Jordan was a fun-loving athletic kid who loved football, baseball, and spending quality time with his dad, Chris. But when his dad rekindled an old flame with 26-year-old Kenzie Hawk, Jordan's home life changed pretty drastically. Chris proposed to Kenzie and asked her to move in with him. She moved into their home with her two young daughters that were from a past relationship. So it went from just Jordan and his dad to a family of five overnight. It's kind of like the Brady Bunch, but way more tense and tragic of an ending. So I guess it's not really like the Brady Bunch and all of that. Anyway, that must have been a lot for Jordan to deal with. Like two new sisters in a matter of minutes, and he probably lost a lot of his dad's attention too. Well, Kenzie and Chris were already expecting their first child together. And at the time of the event, Kenzie was already eight months pregnant. The couple was super excited to welcome their new baby. The nursery was ready, the hospital bag was packed, and they even had a name picked out. Oh, it's so cute. Jordan said that he was excited about getting a new sibling, but what happened next seems to contradict that. I mean, I'm sure he was sad and frustrated about this whole situation. His dad is about to marry a new woman, and they're already having a baby together? Now that he's no longer the apple of his dad's eye, and is about to have to put up with an annoying little brother, Jordan had to be a bit angry. I know that I would be. Like, I'm an only child and I always hated sharing with my friends. I can't even imagine sharing with another sibling. All right, enough about me. Let's get back to the Jordan story. So everything for the wannabe Brady Bunch seemed pretty normal until the morning of February 20th, 2009. Chris got up for work a bit late that morning. Kenzie actually asked him to stay home from work, but he decided to go in. He's gotta make that dough, kids ain't cheap. After her fiance left, Kenzie fell back asleep. When Jordan and his little stepsister Janessa woke up to get ready for school, Jordan was staying in his bedroom upstairs, but when the new baby arrived, he was going to switch room with his dad and stepmom so they could be closer to the nursery. Oh, so that's another point of tension. He's already having to deal with his dad's new woman, two new stepsisters, a younger brother on the way, and he has to give up his room. Damn! Again, being an only child, I wouldn't want to share stuff anyway. So since Jordan was about to swap rooms with Kenzie, his stuff was already in her current room downstairs. That morning, he supposedly went into her room while she was asleep to pick out his clothes for the day. Once Jordan and Janessa were both ready for school, they sat on the couch until they left to catch the bus. At around 8.15 that morning, the kids went out the back door, ran down the driveway, and got on the bus for school. 45 minutes later, landscapers arrived to work on the house. One of the landscapers saw Kenzie's four-year-old daughter crying. He asked her what was wrong, and she told him that her mom was lying motionless in bed. So the landscaper, who was probably losing his shit at this point, called 911. I wonder what was going through the landscaper's head. Like if a woman is found 86 in her bed, and the only people around are a group of adult tree trimmers and one four-year-old child, more than likely, most people would think that one of the adults did it. When the police officers first arrived at the scene, they thought that Kenzie hemorrhaged and passed away. But when they began taking photos of her body, coroners found a bullet wound in the back of her head. They performed CPR, but it was too late. Kenzie and her unborn baby were both declared lifeless. Officers then called Chris and told him to come home immediately. Once he got there, the officers had to break the news that his soon-to-be wife and baby mama had been taken out. Gosh, that, that must have been so rough. And it's so tragic to think that he almost was going to stay home that day. After that, Chris went to the police station to be interviewed. He voluntarily gave a statement about his accounts of events. He said he gave Kenzie a kiss and then left for work that morning. His story was confirmed, and Chris was cleared as a suspect. I mean, it's super sad to me that even though Chris is going through a heartbreaking loss, he's still suspected as a suspect. But after all those other crazy stories that I've heard, you never know who's really capable of doing something like that. The next thing officers do is head to the elementary school to talk to Jordan and Janessa. They asked both kids what happened that morning. Janessa said it was an average morning and didn't mention anything out of the ordinary. Jordan said everything was fairly normal, but he did mention a mysterious black truck parked outside by the garage. After their questioning, Jordan and Janessa were sent home. At 3.30 the very next morning, 
Cops came pounding on Chris and Jordan's door. They had a warrant for Jordan's arrest. Jordan, the 11 year old boy, I'm shook. This boy is literally in the fifth grade and just got pinned for taking his almost stepmom's life. When I was in fifth grade, all I was worried about was kickball and growing up. That's all I was worried about, not, not this stuff. So the cops grabbed Jordan and put him in the back of the patrol car and drove him to the county jail. Okay, but just think about what's going on in Chris's head. This guy just found out that his fiance and unborn child kicked the bucket and now his 11 year old son just got arrested for doing it? That's a lot. So how did this football loving elementary schooler get pinned to the crime? And why did the officers just now take action at 3.30 in the morning? So Kenzie's autopsy revealed the first clue, a single blow to the head from a 20 gauge. The reason that this specific choice is weird is because large weapons like that aren't typically used in crimes committed by random intruders. Like, just think about it. Running down the driveway trying to sneak into someone's house with a three-foot musket, it just doesn't really happen. Here's the second clue. During their search of the house, investigators found several weapons. Most of them belonged to Chris and were used for hunting. One of them was a kid-sized firearm that was given to Jordan by his father one year for Christmas. Okay, first of all, it's crazy that Jordan had his own firearm at 11 years old, but can we talk about the fact that these companies literally make child-sized weapons? That's whack. I mean, what happened to kids getting video games and toys for Christmas? That's all I got when I was a kid. So officers performed a sniff test, which is just a fancy way of saying they took a whiff of the firearm barrel. They noted that Jordan's weapon smelled like it had recently been fired. The bullet size and type also matched Kenzie's wound. Although there was no bodily fluid or tissue on the rifle, investigators were certain that this was the weapon used on Kenzie. They also found three 20 gauge bullet casings in the driveway of the house. The bullet casing matched Jordan's weapon and were right along the path he took to get on the bus. In one of Jordan's interviews, he said that he threw out some lint that was in his pocket on the walk to the bus, but investigators theorized that lint was actually a handful of bullet shells. Okay, so let's jump over to Jordan who just got arrested and brought to an adult jail. He's brought in for a second round of questioning. This time his story is a bit different. He tells investigators that not only was there a sketchy black truck parked outside of their house, but there was a man ducking down in the truck with a hat on. Why would he leave that part off during the first round of questioning? And why did Janessa never mention seeing this truck? Well, when Janessa is interviewed for the second time, she spills the tea. Oh, she spills it, hunty. Oh, and she spills it, alright. She said that she saw Jordan moving his weapons that morning. Ah, yes. Like, let me get dressed for school, eat something for breakfast, and maybe, I don't know, shuffle around my hunting rifles around. Janessa also said when she was waiting for Jordan to finish getting ready, she heard a loud noise. Maybe the sound of a bullet firing? Yo. So why did Janessa also leave all of this out in her first interview? Those two bits of information seem pretty important to the case. I wonder if Jordan talked about it with her or threatened her not to tell. Ooh, time to keep a secret. I know that I would not be able to do anything like that. So with this information, police felt confident that Jordan was the criminal. And remember how much was going on for this little boy? Police believed he had a sufficient motive to do away with his soon to be stepmom. Jordan was first charged for the crime as an adult but his lawyers ended up getting the case moved to juvenile court. Oh, and when he was initially arrested, Jordan was held in an adult jail. I don't even know how to feel at this point. It's like, I want to be mad at this kid for being the possible suspect for such a horrendous crime, but also I want to feel bad for him because he was almost tried as an adult and having to stay in adult jail at age 11. Well, Jordan was eventually found guilty for the crime and served in a juvenile prison until he was 19. After that, he was released on probation until he turned 21. During this whole time, Jordan's lawyers were filing appeals to get his convictions overturned. Jordan never actually admitted to the crime and his lawyers didn't believe there was enough solid evidence that tied Jordan to the case. Yeah, investigators thought that Jordan pinned for the weapon and a viable motive, but they couldn't prove that that was the specific firearm used. It also didn't have any DNA evidence on it and the police didn't even dust for fingerprints on the door to the house to see if there actually could have been an intruder that day. Oh, I mean, that seems a bit sketch that the police went out of their way to dust the little kid's rifle for fingerprints, but not the front door? Like, how did they miss that? So all this time, Jordan's lawyers were trying to get his conviction overturned, but it wasn't until three years later when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court would hear his appeal. The Supreme Court ended up overturning Jordan's conviction due to a lack of sufficient evidence. But at that point, he was already out of jail. Damn. 
If Jordan really isn't the marksman, he just served years in prison and a lifetime of trauma for nothing. Also, I can't get over the fact that his case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Like, you know it must have been a really tough one for everyone to decide if it made it that far. So since Jordan's conviction was overturned, who's responsible for finishing off Kenzie? That is still unknown to this day. The only other suspect on official's radar is one of Kenzie's ex-boyfriends, who she previously filed a restraining order against for threats of violence. Ugh! 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 I'm so confused by this whole story. Was the 11-year-old boy jealous enough of his almost stepmom to knock her out? I mean, his life was drastically changed by his father's new relationship. But would that lead him to go upstairs one morning before school, grab his hunting rifle, go back downstairs to grab bullets, fire at Kenzie in the back of the head, go back upstairs, wipe the weapon clean of any physical evidence, put it back where it was, and toss the shells in the driveway on his way to school? That's a lot. But if it wasn't him, why was he arranging his rifles that morning? Why were there bullet casings on the path to the bus? Why didn't Janessa see the black van? I have so many questions, and it seems like no one has the answers. So it looks like there's only one solution to all of this. Grilled cheese and tomato soup.